I wrote a book about my life named Moguldom. You can get more information about this book at moguldombook.com. I talk about acquiring a knowledge of self, self-determination, and building a business over 10 years. There are some gems in this book that you don't want to miss. One way to support the Go movement in this podcast is to go to moguldombook.com, buy the book on pre-sale to support the Go movement. Let's go. You're listening to Go with Jamarlin Martin. We have a go harder, go home approach as we talk to the leading tech leaders, politicians, and influencers. Let's go. Today we have the great Cedric uh, Rogers and Sean Newsom, co-founders for Cultural Genesis. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Uh, all right, let me start with Cedric. You worked 10 years at Apple and you've been involved with tech for a long time. Can you share with the audience your story and then you know what was your path to working at Apple? So yeah, I'm originally from Houston, Texas, born and raised, um, and I actually always was into technology, you know, like a lot of guys. You know, I mean, like you know, what age are we talking? <sighs> five years old, I was one of those guys that started taking stuff apart. Um, and the older I got, the more things I would try to take apart. Sometimes put, put them back together nicely, sometimes not. Um, but that was kind of my curiosity always. Um, also, my parents, man, being from Texas, they were big into putting up a lot of lights for Christmas, and I would be the one subject to doing that responsibility. So I learned a lot about current <laughs> um, doing that. And so that's kind of really got my curiosity around electricity and then from, went from there to RF. So I really started being more into hardware, remote control cars, all this kind of stuff, and computers, of course, uh, really got me on my way into like, knew, I knew very, very early I wanted to be an electrical engineer completely. Yeah. At what age are you talking? I probably knew around 12, 13 years old. Yeah. There's like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to be an engineer. That was, that was it. So it was very, very clear. That was what I wanted to study in school. And so, um, I had the opportunity, I went to a prep school in Houston, but then I had the opportunity to kind of really see what was out there. Um, and I was probably leaning university of Texas, Texas A&M kind of thing. And, um, uh, but then Jesse Jackson actually came to my high school and spoke, um, and kind of really started talking to the, all of the guys. It was so a few of us that were, you know, black and were at the school. Um, and he pulled us aside, kind of really told us about North Carolina A&T, where he went to school. Yeah. And he was like, uh, it's a great engineering school. Yeah, you know, you should consider it. And uh, funny enough, I did. And my brother-in-law went to the school as well. So it was kind of like, let me go check it out. And um, I've always been fond of uh, young women. And I went to the school, and there was a nice strip uh, full of, like, co-eds and I was like oh yeah this is a school for me so uh between that and um then I also got a scholarship to run track too so it just kind of all fell into place for me and I uh definitely enjoyed that institution so went from A&T um and you know really was a great program for me uh to be around so many like-minded people uh then I went from there to uh my first gig was actually Motorola uh, as an RF engineer uh, and I went from Motorola to Hewlett Packard for a short stint and then Hewlett Packard to Apple. So my first two jobs, I didn't stay in them too long, like a lot of people bounced and around. Did you get your first job using like career services at North Carolina AT&T where that was lined up as soon as you graduated? Yeah. Now you yeah. got to make sure it's North Carolina a t If you say yeah. AT&T, man, they'll kill you <laughs> at our school for that. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, North Carolina. Yeah, and I, that's exactly right. Office of Career Services. Um, you know, I was in Nesby. I'm gonna be very transparent. I was in Nesby, um, and you know, National uh, Institute of Electrical uh, Electrical Engineers. Um, those organizations really put me in the network, and uh, it was real. It was actually fairly easy to get a job coming out of uh, A&T because so many you know companies come there looking for you know black engineers. So it was easy, easy path. Um, and then I. Wound up really settling into Apple. Um, actually, I met Apple at a Nesby conference, and I was there uh, on behalf of HP, actually. I uh, started conversations with them, and it was a time where Steve had just come back to the company for a few years, and it was really interesting to see what was happening with the iPod at the time. And I said, hey, this might be something worth checking out. So I went into Apple kind of you know, really exploratory, and I wound up getting an opportunity to do so many different wonderful things, um, and they treated me well, including paying for my MBA, so I really have fond uh, memories and still great relationships at Apple now. 
did you ever meet or see Steve Jobs? Yeah, uh, fortunately, I was able to work with Tim Cook and Steve um, on when I was there. I think it was like three or four years into the company. Um, I was one of those kind of people that always had an entrepreneur mindset, no matter what I did. And I was looking at where we were going with the iPad and said, wow, you know, Steve was actually talking about the fact that he wanted to take the iPad into different verticals. So I blindly sent Steve an email and says, hey, I got an idea. Uh, how about we do things with athletics for with the iPad? And he's just like, he, he always would reply back to employees if, he, if you had a good idea. Um, and he liked it. And he said, hey, yeah, you should work on that. Um, and inside it kind of all kind of snowballed from there, me working with uh, Tim Cook. And a lot of executives in Apple are big sports people. So this is kind of an easy sell. Steve uh, Cook, Clemson? Tim Cook, Tim Cook, yeah. Yeah, Tim Cook, he's Clemson, right? Uh, no, he went to Auburn. Auburn, University. Auburn, okay, mm-hmm. Auburn, yeah. Mm-hmm. And funny enough, I did something really cool at Auburn where we had, back when Cam Newton was the quarterback, we yeah. did this really cool thing with them where they had the whole team with iPads and we had the playbook for Cam and the whole thing. So it became the, really the standard of what started happening in athletics. So during your run at Apple, uh, I got to imagine stock options were was part of your package and you made that well with your Apple options. Uh, in complete transparency, Apple's, <laughs> the the, the uh, RSUs they afforded me, uh, a lot of reasons why I was able to take some of the risks that I took to go into entrepreneurship, right? Uh, I had a little bit of a, a cushion there to kind of take some risk because I had that. So, um, so yeah, it, they did. They treated me well. Yeah, that sounds like a hell of a run. If you, you, you're you starting around the time of the iPod, uh, yeah, that sounds like a, um, a, a good run. So... You spend 10 years at Apple, mm-hmm. and you know, there's a lot of talk about so called diversity, where kind of people who look like us are not kind of represented according to our kind of population. And it's hard to find people who look like us, right? In, in Silicon Valley. Uh, what was your experience there in terms of your interaction with the kind of environment out there yeah i mean honestly when i walked went into apple early it was very very few people of color there um a lot of asian americans white americans you know working in a company where me walking in uh the whole time i was there i could probably count on my hand how many people of color i would see I wow mean, early. you're talking about 10 years like yeah. man i don't see us showing up uh, i don't I don't not really at all. But what, what wound up happening is Apple made more investment into Apple retail, and you started seeing them actually go deeper that way. They realized that they needed to have, you know, a workforce that represented the people they wanted to serve. And so you started seeing in the Apple retail division more and more people of color coming uh, of all, and gender too. Um, and Denise Young-Smith, who's no longer there, she was one of my mentors. She was head of HR for Apple retail under Ron Johnson. And she did a wonderful job of really uh, even work with me to do some things, you know, to really recruit people um, into the organization. And she then became head of HR for all of Apple for a period of time as well, since she recently left. So she was kind of, to me, a catalyst, someone that a lot of people may or may not know of, but Denise Young-Smith, she went to Grambling University, AKA, you know, from Grambling University. And so she really got it and did a lot to cultivate culture, that I felt that was not there when I first started. My first job out of uh, Morehouse with a political science degree was at uh, McKinsey and Company, and I worked in a low-level job. And I remember I didn't see people who looked like us, with the exception of the mail room. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so in the McKinsey mail room, it was right. pretty deep. They got a lot of mail in the land right. office coming through. Right. So when we talk about the numbers. Uh, the so-called diversity numbers that these tech companies print. In Apple's case, they may print a number uh, where they include the lower wage retail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that may make up 90% of us. Just like McKinsey, they may report in terms of employees, but they're not disclosing that, hey, 70% of those employees, they work in our mailroom. So how important is it for kind of, more detailed to come out when these tech companies are being forced in some cases are voluntarily sharing their uh, employment numbers by race. I I look at it um, two or three fold. One, starting with Apple, I will say before Steve passed, I was doing a lot out of Atlanta actually. Um, 
and we even were able to bring Morehouse and Spelman out to to Apple for executive briefings and do a lot to try to expose the company to the folks at Apple because a lot of it is it's like a lack of education and, and knowledge about what the potential is and um, I think what was interesting was that we wound up having a professor out of Spelman who actually made such an impression upon Steve that he actually brought him out to do a sabbatical for six months at Apple. Um, so Steve really did understand culture and wanted to like leverage it and he always saw it through music. That's one reason why he, iPod, he was so passionate about it, you know, and, and the potential there. Um, I, however, would say that he, as well as many people knew, there wasn't enough, right? It's still way more that can be done. Um, and from my perspective, what I was trying to do personally was actually do more recruiting, helping in that area. Uh, and then I wanted to plant the seeds inside of youth. So uh, my nephew, I talk about him all the time. Um, he was in the seventh grade, and I taught him how to code. And it was based upon the, his, his desire to learn about the iPhone and iPad. Um, and now he's finishing up at MIT in computer science, right? So I feel like the community has a responsibility to help, of course, get pipeline. But in the same right, though, organizations need to, you know, actively go find and promote uh, this to young people uh, in the community. And I'll say that one thing that's interesting about Apple now is that they are trying to do more of that seed these programs into K-12 through schools. That's where it has to start. It has to start with the youth. You touched on an important point in, ter in terms of community responsibility. You, me, kind of doing our part. If you break up this complex problem around so-called tech diversity, so-called uh, so diversity in Silicon Valley, if you break it up as 100% pie, if the needle's going to be moved and the numbers are going to change, what percentage is going to come from us mm -hmm. taking initiative mm -hmm. and looking to optimize the culture and kind of promoting STEM and doing a lot on our side right. uh, versus begging Google, begging Apple, go, begging Facebook, right. save the community's deficiency in technology and engineering and STEM. Right. What percentage would you say is on us? If you want my opinion, I'm biased. Yeah, I feel like it's like <laughs> I would probably argue well, well over 80, 90 percent. It's only 90 percent. And here's the reason why. Um, first and foremost, we are some of the largest consumers of technology in America. Right. We actually, Sean and myself, we created Culture Genesis on this whole foundation of the fact that we see that people of color, especially African-American and Latino, are over indexing in their use of technology. When it comes to whether it's messaging, video consumption, music consumption, gaming, which is one of our first products, all of that is really being dictated and driven by people of color. But what has to change is that we have to get out of the, the mindset of being consumers and being more in the mindset of being the producers. And then what Sean and I want to see even more of are investors, right? People who are going to look at people of color who are actually out there making technology and supporting that and bringing you know, capital to those individuals so they can scale the business, right? Um, yeah. So we can hire our own um, and really do, I think, what's really, really needed and what we do in music, right? We, computer science and, and writing music, not too far off. I mean, it's really taking something right off the top of your dome and being able to put it down on some paper and in case of coding into the computer, right? But it's taking your creativity, your understanding of what people want and making something real building something from nothing. We have the capacity to do that. It's just that we're not being completely you know, taught, cultivated, and, it's, and that takes time. But I will say this, you look around, there's way more of us in this now than ever before. I feel like you mentioned Jesse Jackson, and I love your point of view in terms of, look, we should focus on what we can control, and we should really focus on building up the community. We have to be a big part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So I love that point of view. It makes me think about though, because of it seems like the consensus uh, that's out there or what's popular is Silicon Valley, Google, Facebook, they gotta come and save the community and fix all this stuff and make people like coding like they like Cardi B. But you're saying, look, this is an in-house thing. That's 
possibly the companies could do more, but you're going to move the needle more by focusing on lifting ourselves up. And I feel like what some folks in the consensus would say is similar to Jesse Jackson when Barack Obama was saying, hey, we need to take more responsibility as fathers, as husbands, and the black community needs to optimize internally that it's not all about white folks. And and when Barack Obama said this, Jesse Jackson said he was talking down to black people and I want to cut off his nuts. This is Jesse Jackson's (laughs) words, not mine. And you, you know, you always have this kind of division where there's a segment where because of the legacy of white supremacy and discrimination, people don't like to talk about what we need to do mm-hmm. ourselves. Like mm-hmm. we're doing, we, we, we can elevate. We can't wait for these institutions to change, that we're going to have to get moving in terms of you know, building up the community. Well, you know what's so funny about <clears throat> this, this conversation is like we don't talk about needing people to go make more basketball courts we find our way to the basketball courts easily right yeah i mean there's no there's nothing that seems to keep us from that um you know or you look at even playing sports uh like football another sport right there's nothing stopping us there i don't see i see learning how to code very similar like there is a there's a learning curve so i'm not sitting here trying to say it's super easy because it's not take some level of dedication and commitment but if you think about it like now for someone like Sean and myself to create the company we created, you don't, you don't need any lumber, steel, coal, the things that have been needed in the past to build a company, those things are like not needed. You can take your time and really come from the top of your dome literally to create things. And I think that's the power that we have today. And so when you argue, you know, we just recently celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday, like the dream is more real today than ever before, where you can literally take someone and say, hey, man, you can go create something and build something for nothing without needing a lot of help and support. Same way we're doing this podcast. I mean, literally, if you got a Mac and a microphone and you yeah. get access to the, to the internet, you go to you can go to Starbucks and you, you're off and on your way. Yeah. I think that's the kind of opportunity we have, but we have to almost look and see them, though. We, you know, I think that's the thing is, like, how do we help our, our youth see those opportunities in the same way that they see the opportunity of playing basketball or, or making music or anything that we do in entertainment because we do that so well? You leave Apple. Talk about your path to starting Cultural Genesis and what you guys do. Wow. Um, so, yeah, my leaving Apple, I, I've created two ventures prior to the one that I've been able to co-found with Sean. Um, I did a first one. It was really based on my passion. I want to help youth really around some of this scenario of inspiring youth to kind of find their passion. You're not waiting for Facebook or Google to come save. Nah, You're going in. Nah, you want to be the Superman. I'm hands on. I'm hands on. I'm a, yeah. I'm a solutions minded person, yeah. you know. Um, so literally the first venture. I created, it was a platform, um, did it with a couple of former um, Apple employees as well. Um, you know, it was a lot of lessons I had to learn about scaling a startup there, um, but it did get some traction and it had a lot of support from youth organizations like Boys and Girls Club, et cetera, starting out of Atlanta. Uh, then I had the, the fortunate opportunity to work with Paul Judge, who you may uh, have yeah, run across, with uh, Dr. Paul Judge. Uh, so we co-founded another venture called um, look live and we went through Y Combinator um, and it's part of the uh, summer 16 batch. So that was a wonderful opportunity for me to learn a lot from Paul um, and also to learn a lot through YC's process of how to build and scale startups. And uh, so then I went on to wanted to really come to LA and get kind of really into this ecosystem. So, and um, I came here, and a good friend of, mutual friend of Sean and myself, his name is uh, Rashawn Williams, another one of your Morehouse brothers, yeah. um, who is also my fraternity brother. And it's like, hey, man, you know, uh, you and Sean are two bright brothers that you know, might actually come up with something. So that was a few years ago he introduced us. And, and Sean and I do, we, we really get along, and he's super creative and technical, and I feel like I'm fairly the same. Um, and so we've always been kind of like thinking about what we want to do next. And one of the core focuses for both of us was to really start to build something that we could then go hire other people like us to build. Um, and we wanted to build technology focusing on 
on the culture. And so uh, that's what we did. We went and um, we got our initial funding here in L.A. from Mucker Capital up the street down here here in Santa Monica. Uh, how much capital? Uh, so total, we don't always release our numbers yeah. to tell you, but I mean, we've we've raised all, roughly a million already. And, okay. Uh, things are going well for us to continue down that road. That road. So that was just pre-seed. So, um, you know, with that being the case, that we attracted capital from them, and then on subsequently to uh, Beta Works over in uh, New York, um, and we were able to work with them. And part of their, they have these camps that are around different technologies that are merging, and we ours is around the live streaming interactive space. So that's what we are focusing on. So. Uh, we've had a we've had a fairly good run so far, and it's we've been blessed to like ha because of our experience to be able to have great conversations with investors and for them to make investment in us. and And I can't omit uh, one of our recent investments uh, from Ti and Jason Jeter. Uh, they have um, a group that they put together a syndicate called uh, Tech Cipher. And they recently have made us an investment in us as well. So we've been able to attract. Uh, investors with many more that are very interested in continuing to work with us. So and I think a, lar a large part of that is to do to Sean's resume and myself and the team that we've been able to build. How do you get a guy like T.I. interested? Like, how does that develop where you get him in the cap table? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, I lived in Atlanta for a minute, you know, so I was able to you know, I believe you want any authentic relationship that takes time, right, for people to see how you work and what you do and how you move. And um, so I, I ran across Jason Jeter, who is T.I.'s co-founder for uh, Grand Hustle Records. Um, and Jason and I have known each other for probably about four or five years now in out of Atlanta. And he just was able to see, like, how I moved and what we were working on and uh, they actually came to us early to want us to help them on a project. I won't talk about it because we may wind up doing it one day. Uh, we didn't do it right away, but they were able to see kind of Sean and myself, what we were working on, and they were like, yeah, I like what y'all are doing. So as we kind of moved on and started scaling the business and getting uh, capital, we stayed in contact with them, and they were like, yeah, we're interested in investing because I think with people like you know, some of the folks like T.I. and other, you know, I think celebrities who have made investments, some of them early on have made bad investments, frankly. And I think they were looking to make good investments and making an investment based on the founders. And I think that's what really helped us. Let's get Sean in, in, involved. Can you explain the business model? The business model called Gen is rooted in the vision of being able to create a platform for multicultural content creators to be able to, number one, monetize you know, reach an audience in a very authentic way. So that's the core business model. When you, when, you, when you take a step back and then you look at the audience, the, the, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, multicultural content creators are way undervalued compared to their counterparts. So that was the core reason, and that's the business model. The business is that we want to be able to have a platform that we own that's authentic to the demographic we're going after, the multicultural audience, black and brown. Uh, and, so from a business, and so from a business perspective, we see a real opportunity to leverage that and build digital, like, digital apps that develop um, around that audience, engage that audience in very authentic ways. And then obviously, you know, from a cultural perspective, you know, hip hop, Fashion is all being led by this exact same demographic. So um, naturally, those the you know the advertising dollars, brands, you know big businesses, they, they're going to want to spend to attract those eyeballs. So that's our business model in a nutshell: is one being able to create a platform for our content creators, uh, and two being able to like attract the eyeballs of advertisers that want to reach those reach that audience. So let's say you you hook up with a content creator, what happened? In the case of Trivia Mob, Trivia Mob was a show that you know me and Cedric conceptualized, uh, and it was uh, we took a fresh spin off of one of the more popular mobile apps that have launched in the last you know, year, which is HP Trivia, uh, which is the concept of interactive game shows that you can play a game show live on your phone with your friends, your coworkers, all at the same time. Uh, and we, we decided to say, listen, let's take a fresh take on that uh, and kind of almost kind of a, if you remember 106 in Park, 
kind of looking at that same dynamic of male female um but like the male and female hosts would be like influencers um that people might follow already on social media instagram facebook etc right uh and so we we work with them as hosts to host the show uh and the reason why the show is called trivia mob is because we activate their following their following is almost like a mob um, so they bring their following on the platform uh, to as another way of engaging them other than just posting pics and going on Instagram Live or Facebook Live. Uh, so they, they come to us because they want to be able to activate their following in a, a unique way to keep them more engaged. Uh, so they, so it, it's usually we, number one, they either come to us directly um, th- or through our existing hosts that refer them to us. Uh, and then we kind of, number one, train them how to like actually host the show. Uh, and then at that point, we almost, in a lot of ways, we mostly like theme shows around their brand. So it feels really authentic when they come on. Do you hire a full-time developer to create the trivia game? Or are you contracting with another agency? How are you guys building that particular application? No, for sure. Yeah. So t- tech wise, we've built everything in-house. Uh, so we have, you know, I myself as a CTO, um, Cedric being the CEO, um, but we've, we've all worked together from a product perspective to conceptualize the product. Uh, we have an iOS developer and an Android developer on staff. So we've developed everything in-house uh, and we have a full production team that handles like the techno produ- technical production of the show. For the mm. audience, mm. what's the range of costs all in? to develop an, a mobile app like this. Can you share that or it's yeah, all right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think this yeah. is, in the mobile app space, especially a mobile app like this, it's, it's not so much just the mobile app, there's also the process behind the mobile app, the way you deliver the content to the end user. Um, so it's, it's a rolling cost, put it like that, okay. um, in tens of thousands of dollars. To get it, to get it out. <laughs> to, yeah, to get, to it, get it out. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's not a, it's not a simple use case in, in, uh, uh, in kind of like technical terms. Um, you can imagine if you're in Miami and Cedric's in Atlanta and I'm in New York City, like we all have to be seeing the same thing, seeing the same data at the same exact time. Yeah. Uh, and so there's technical challenges with the way just the internet works today the way your phones work. Um, so there's a lot of things you have to do to be able to deliver that experience at a high quality level so that you can reach the most number of users because you, you, don't, you don't want to be getting the answer when Cedric's getting the question and then, you know, it's not fair if you're trying to win some money here, you know, so. <laughs> and are, are you guys marketing on Facebook and YouTube in terms of cost per download? No, so, we, so this goes back to the whole content creator influencer model that we've taken. You know, we, we've we been completely organic. Um, we've worked with some kind of notable influencers um, to kick off the show, such as like, I don't know if you're familiar with Melvin Gregg. He was a popular uh, Vine star that trans, um, you know, t- that, that went to Instagram. Now he's also doing some Netflix shows. So we actually partnered with him because we saw the importance of social media, especially for the audience that we're going after, our demographic. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so we started there first. Uh, and, you know, that's the primary way that we drive eyeballs and downloads to the show um, is through our host promoting naturally um, to their followings, announcing that they're going to host the show. And how do you pay your influencer marketing partners? Like, is there... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have a, we have a, a simple structure in place that helps incentivize them. Um, but to be, you know, you know, they kind of do it because it's fun um, in a lot of ways. So the most things that the show is a fun show um, and also their, their following and their mob can win money. So they almost like bringing something new to the table for their people that already follow them. Uh, and then obviously we have incentives in, involved as well. And, and yeah. are the incentives based on how many downloads you get or no, it's not traced to that? No, it's not even traced to that. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. So we have, it, I don't want to go deep into that, but, um, you know, we just, there's incentives if they win versus another host wins. <laughs> okay, got it. And so from where you guys are now, of course, you, you, you raised uh, funding. How do you guys scale? Like, what are the next steps? Yeah, no, I mean, we scale with, um, you know, simply, you know, in, in traditional sense, most mobile apps, especially games scaled, you know, with word of mouth. Um, You know, I think, you know, this is a very social app. Um, You can, you can refer a friend, 
you know, to get an extra shot at winning the cash prize every week. Um, those type of things are like natural ways for us to scale. Um, but even bigger than that, as a business, you know, we see us, you know, um, scaling in a ways of also in, in, uh, in empowering other content um, providers or content studios, you know, production studios, platforms that want to also have interactive game shows. We're also going to scale from a tech perspective as well and offer our technology as a service to power other game shows. Let's go back to Cedric. As you know, uh, HBCUs uh, have been under a massive amount of financial pressure, including Morehouse. There's a sentiment in the community that we need to save the HBCUs. Uh, most recently, uh, there was a, a push to save Bennett. Yep. And so the consensus, let's call it the black establishment, they're like, hey, we got to save all the HBCUs. Right, right, right. And then on the other hand, you got companies out of Silicon Valley who are thinking about how do we design the next generation education systems that are technology oriented and more updated and that have a low amount of debt where we're preparing for the next generation that's going to knock out the old system that, that's loaded up with debt. So this is what, what some of the uh, companies, of course, uh, uh, EDU tech companies, they're working on this in Silicon Valley. And then you have the, the black pro HBCU establishment saying, send millions of dollars and save all the HBCUs. Why is it problematic for the community to believe that we need to save all HBCU? Or do you think that's problematic? Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, first and foremost, when you take a step back and think about education. So when I started with Apple, I started an education division, so I got a chance to really look at a lot of this. Education is a very intimate thing. People learn differently. You know, there's people who are definitely going to be more auditory learners and visual learners and, um, you know, people coming from different backgrounds that are going to need maybe a little bit more than others. Um, and so for me, it's kind of a very, you need different types of education offerings, quite frankly. Um, and I see HBCUs as a very interesting thing, uh, specifically, because I have a niece who's at North Carolina A&T behind me. Uh, my nephew was at MIT, um, and my sister went to Texas, and I went to North Carolina ENT. So I'm gonna give you what I see. Sometimes, depending on who you are and what you need at the time that you're going into higher education, you might need that environment that is a little bit more nurturing than I have found at, say, an HBCU. Some, I mean, some people really need the environment that. is the environment high value. Is it's high, high value. value. I mean, yeah. you, you're learning. Yeah, you're learning African American studies. Yeah, you're learning, you know, differential equations or whatever it is, physics. But then there's also like you're growing up, right? There, there's a whole nother thing going on, you know, yeah. as you cross in this threshold of, you know, into adulthood. And at HBCUs, like uh, I had professors who genuinely cared about me and didn't give a really a care about some of the, you know, they care about my academics, but they care about me personally. Yeah. And, you know, they would have called my parents if I didn't show up to class. <laughs> you know, is that kind of scenario. Yeah. I got professors now from my, uh, engineering that still check on me to this day, you know, this, and they're proud of me like a parent would be, you know, and it's not to say you can't find that a majority white school too, because you can, because yeah. there's all kinds of great educators everywhere. But I just feel like when it comes to HBCUs, I feel like there's some youth that need that experience. Um, and I feel like you come out sometimes with more confidence because the next thing is, is that is there is this imposter syndrome that you will feel, especially going into technology Yeah. because there's just not many of us in the space. Uh, so, for the audience who may not be familiar with that term, can you explain imposter syndrome? Yeah. You know, imposter syndrome is from the way I, you know, internalize it. It's like you're this person who've gone, who's gone through engineering and you feel like you've been prepared, but then you walk into this predominantly white environment and you see all these people moving around and you would like to yourself is like, should I even be here? Am I, am I prepared? Like, am I as good as they are? And you're doubting yourself because you don't know. And you may not have a mentor either to kind of tell you that really at the end of the day, when you take these, these hard technical backgrounds, really no one knows, right? You, you, you're all 
still, still kind of figuring out. When Apple hires a brand new employee, they're still just trying to give them a chance to figure out. You know, it's just that the sometimes the environment is more conducive to for some people than others, and I think that's a big part of this. But when you sometimes go to HBCU though, know, and you're in Nesby, you got them people you can call up. And I'm like, yo, man, I'm at this, like, how's it for you? And you can, like, have this, like, exchange that grounds you in a way that helps you, like, literally get your career started. And I think that's a, it's an, a very important thing for a lot of people. Not everyone needs it. Yeah. But there's still a strong group that, that, that does. Yeah, those are uh, very important points. Do you have any skepticism about the thought that all the HBCUs need to be saved? So, for example, let me just throw stuff out. So, as you know... There's a massive amount of student debt that has accumulated because of the lack of wealth in the black community. This student debt crisis, of course, disproportionately impacts us. So, so we may go to HBCUs and, and, and get degrees, but because there's so much debt and you got to go in the workforce and be black, too, uh, <laughs> that, hey, you know, I learned so much from building with other brothers and sisters at HBCUs mm -hmm. in that healthy, supportive environment. That stuff is high value. That helped make me to the person, right, or, or us uh, that we are today. However, because of the economics and the, the way the system is working now, can we rethink that experience and reimagine kind of possibly getting some of that kind of environmental, cultural support stimulus without the debt. And so are we going to stick and go another 50 years by saying all HBCUs need to be supported, send all the money to HBCUs, or like in the free market uh, where things are optimized and you have winners and losers, hey, the HBCUs that are graduating people at 70%, and that they're able to almost guarantee a high paying job where you can pay off your debt. Let's keep those. And you guys over here where the economics are so bad, the graduation rates are so bad, the debt is so bad, the professional out salary outlook is so bad, you guys are going to have to consolidate or shut down. Do you think that this stuff needs to be rationalized in terms of all these forces playing out or just... Hey, we got to keep it going. I'll, I'll say this. There's a lot of factors to what you said. I mean, a whole lot of factors, but you threw it. Um, first of all, higher education in and of itself is broken. I mean, everyone will tell you that. Um, and people in tech have, like you mentioned, a lot of ed tech companies have been trying to innovate and bring technology, uh, the, the massively open online courses, the MOOCs, so they called them at one time, was a big thing for so long. Um, trying to see if that could help, to your point, like bring technology, uh, excuse me, education to folks in the ways in which they could learn and, of course, lower costs. But I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of part the government plays in this, too, um, to really figure out a way to really think about how to make education less expensive as a whole. Um, I think when you go drilling down onto HBCUs, I'm very, 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 very proud of my uh, alma mater, um, North Carolina T. They really have done a wonderful job um, of like really building an institution up. They really, really have. But it's a state institution, and it's one of the few engineering institutions in the state of North Carolina. So they're able to attract state dollars as well as private dollars from NASA. That's the model, like a Morgan and, yeah, State. They're getting, all, yeah, they're getting a lot of funding there. So that is how. Any organization, whether it's a startup we're building or whatever, you have to have capital to really go invest into what you're doing. Otherwise, you can't attract the best professors. You can't have the facilities that students want to have, you know, live, study, uh, and, and, and dwell in. And so it's a very you know, layered thing. So it's hard for me to blanketly say uh, agree or disagree with what you're saying, honestly, because I feel like there's so many levels to it. But I do feel like institutions do have to be held accountable, right? And, they, and the, best, the best people to hold them accountable are the people that go there, the students, the families, to say this is what we are looking for, uh, our dollars are going towards, and I think that requires us, once again, the community be engaged in like, hey, why can't y'all be more like, in my case, I'm gonna say like North Carolina A&T. What are they doing that we're not doing at X institution? Um, I think that's some of the conversation, but you know, 
like I said, when it comes to HBCUs, that there may be a few out there that could use opportunity to find new leadership. I think that's one of the things I noticed yeah. at HBCUs is oftentimes, if you notice, uh, they have a, a, a very a transient leadership. They don't keep sometimes leaders long enough. I think at one point Morehouse was really good at that, keeping leaders in place for a long period yeah. of time. But even Morehouse hit a spell where they started having yeah, they had a, a little coup. bit of transition, yeah. right? And so, you know, when that happens, it's hard to get momentum. It's hard for, you know, the private sector to trust, you know, the institution when they don't know and have a relationship with the leadership. Um, and I think that's a big part of what it takes to be successful. Um, so, you know, private institutions, I think, have a harder time than some of the publics. Like, you know, you think about FAMU, North Carolina A&T, some of those, they get a lot of funding from state. Um, because they're doing some of the things that the state is, are needing. Uh, so to answer your question, I don't have a blanket answer to that one. I think that's a very tough one. Yeah. Uh, and I do think there's opportunity for improvement, but it's hard for me just to wipe them off. I love my HBCU. Yeah. Frank. For the audience, one of the EDU tech companies I was referring to is called Lambda. Here's an overview of what Lambda does. Lambda School trains people online to be software engineers at no upfront cost. Uh, instead of paying tuition, students can agree to pay a percentage of their income after their employee and only if they're making more than 50K per year. If you don't find a job and don't reach that level of income, you don't have to pay Lambda anything. So the innovation that, that, that's coming out around education, it's rationalizing, of course, college debt. Hey, you know, it's giving incentives where we're not just going to give you a $50,000 or $100,000 degree. Don't even pay us if we don't help you be successful and make money and make this thing work. I just think that the HBCU establishment, we need a response to all these different forces uh, and kind of these new models with Lambda, where we're not just trying to patch up the Titanic, some of these schools... Things are changing fast. Uh, the problem is, is, is getting bigger and bigger in terms of economics and, and wages, particularly for us, that we got to kind of reimagine, reimagine this stuff. I agree with you. I mean, I think in America as a whole, people are a lot, a lot of people are afraid of what's happening in technology, worried about robots, worried about this. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to own our education, right, and, and retool our workforce. I mean, that has to happen in America as a whole. Um, but then when you... I always sometimes would say, like, of course, when America catches a cold, black America catches pneumonia, right? Yeah. And um, so that, to your point, means that this, this acceleration of education, understanding technology as one uh, focus is, is paramount. I look at something like Lambda. I'm not as familiar. Sean nodded at me that he's familiar. Um, I think it's one of those things, though, I bet you that's more like a startup company than anything else, well-funded yeah. um, by those who are coming from Silicon Valley. There's people, including Steve Jobs' wife, she's throwing a lot of capital um, at trying to find ways to innovate in education. Yeah. And I think, like a lot of other things in life, that's not being made available to our community, right? Yeah. So our community has to think about, is there, first of all, a format that makes sense? And who's going to invest in it? I mean, is you going to go, you know, get some... You would ideally want to think you can find the right investors, but it's always usually more challenging sometimes recognize. But even with that, I like Lambda. It's a great idea from what conceptually, but it's always like, yeah. how does it really, really work? But it yeah. sounds pretty innovative. To piggyback on that, uh, so Lambda, you know, I've heard of it and it's interesting, but I think it's um, kind of one of the kind of the effects, or I, I would say some kind of symptoms of Silicon Valley. Um, when you look at the model, you know, that model is essentially helping Silicon Valley be able to get, you know, more talent homebred there, right? So, you know, could you bring that exact same model and bring it to Cleveland or, you know, different other other like like other cities? It's optimized yeah, for that it's, geo it, area. Correct. If, if that that model doesn't work, if there's not a, a, a rich need for computer science engineers, that type, you know, in that specific region, otherwise it doesn't help out, right? So you know, it makes sense for it to and, and, and Lambda is a for-profit institution, um, you know, and it's you know it was started out in Silicon Valley, which has a hot huge need for software engineers, right? Yeah. And computer scientists. So yeah, you can you could 
there's 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 a need in that specific region for investors to put money into that because they've also invested in tons of other startup companies that need to scale and you can't scale without smart engineers right or at least engineers in house so I think it's you know it's one of those type of things so you know um, that I, I don't know how that scales kind of even nationally or even globally you know realistic this is part one tune into the next episode for part two. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Go. You could check me out at Jamarla Martin on Twitter and also come check us out at moguldom.com. That's M O G U L D O M.com. Be sure to subscribe to our daily newsletter. You can get the latest information on crypto, tech, economic empowerment, and politics. Let's go.